Hey everybody, welcome back to the Vortex Edge podcast. Jimmy here and I'm joined by two of our lovely, I will say lovely, uh, sniper instructors, well, long range instructors. They are, they were snipers, I guess. I don't know if it's once a sniper, always a sniper. Uh, but anyway, so uh, yeah, Justin and Corey are here. And just like we did on the last podcast where I had Chris and Brennan on the range and we were actually doing some live fire training and instruction and having that conversation while we were doing the podcast, we're gonna do that again today for long range precision stuff. This is something I know I'm really excited about because I feel like for so many people out there, you know, showing up to the range is, is something that we like to do. We like the idea of what it's going to do for us, get us better in many ways. But I think a lot of people just kind of show up and they maybe sit at a bench or they stand in a bay or they go prone and they just kind of shoot at various different targets with not a whole lot of aim to what it is that they're doing. Maybe they are actually aiming at targets, but you know, what's the end goal of what you're actually doing? So uh, that's kind of the fun part about getting to do podcasts like this. You get to see what instructors like these guys who, who shoot day in, day out, and are, are always looking for ways to get better, get to sh see what they do on their range days. So uh, I know you guys now uh, do a lot of, obviously, instructing, but then you do long-range competitions and things like that. So part of what we're going to talk today uh, definitely relates to uh, a competitive um, sort of outlet for long-range shooting. Uh, but it can also work for other things too. If you're into, you know, hunting uh, or really, I mean, any kind of precision shooting, any kind of shooting that involves an element of wanting to be very precise, which I can't actually think of a type of shooting where <laughs> even like pistol shooting, you know, you want to hit where you're aiming, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, all right. What do you guys, uh, what do you guys have for us today? Like what's, what are we going to be working on? So today uh, we're going to do, be working on a drill called time on target drill. Uh, so basically, we're just going to really focus on the first shot on target, which is arguably uh, important across the board, whether you're a competitive shooter, sniper, hunter, uh, whatever it might be. Just kind of breaking down the aspect of building a position, getting into that position, and getting your first shot on target. Mm -hmm. um, and along with what you said earlier, just deliberate practice. So we showed up to the range today. That's what we're working on. Uh, and I'd encourage the viewers to try to, when you go to the range, just hone in on something, pick a skill set or a drill or whatever it is and go to the range and deliberately practice that, analyze yourself. And I think that really kind of supercharges your time at the range in shooting. Yeah, absolutely. So. And you know, I mean, with the you know, cost of ammo and sometimes ammo av availability and things like that, I feel like you can get so much more out of maybe even fewer rounds at times when you actually have a focus to your practice, you know? Um, everybody, you know, occasionally just likes to just send some rounds down range and hit a target far away. That's totally fun. That's yeah. that's like uh, uh, around here, we call it Midwestern yoga, but I don't reckon you have to be <laughs> in the Midwest to uh, enjoy the, uh, the, the fun of doing that. But um, we're gonna do that. We're shooting at, so the way you guys have this set up, maybe we can yeah. talk about that a little bit. We obviously have our, our guns, which we can get into here, but we're actually not going to be shooting out of the prone. Uh, for those listening here, we are uh, at a range that allows us to shoot anywhere from 100 to 1,000 yards, but uh, we're going to be shooting at 400 yards on a steel target off of kind of a, a post here that's set up at about, I don't know, a little bit above waist height for all of us 5'10-ish guys. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what's, what's the point of this setup? Like, why, why do you guys have it set up this particular way where we're going to be shooting off of, uh, like I said, not prone, it's kind of, what do you call this? Like... So uh, be, it's kind of reduced standing position. Yeah. So I'm not standing upright. I have to lower my, my profile to get behind the gun properly and bend at the, the waist. So I'll just call it a reduced standing uh, okay. position. Um, so we have it set up like that. Just we want to be a couple steps back because we're not really concerned about, you know, running into position and setting up position. We're really honing in on approaching the barricade that you're going to shoot off of and then building the position and then getting into that position and getting your first shot on target. Mm -hmm. So just a couple of steps back from the barricade, taking a couple steps forward, placing your bag, uh, setting the gun in, getting the position and getting your first shot on target. What do you think that uh, folks who try this need to concentrate on the most? Is it, are they trying to like the end goal? <clears throat> is it that I want to be able to do this faster or is it that I want to be able to do this and get into my, you know, we've talked about things like natural point of aim. Like, do I want to get into that better? Is it, is it like, what's, what's the maybe most important thing for people to concentrate on here? So all of those things are important, but uh, <laughs> I would say you can only consciously focus on one thing at a time. But uh, 
the thing is efficiency is, I like to say efficiency, I don't want to say go faster, because I think that produces the wrong mindset. People just try to go faster and yeah. you can quickly miss your target and that's not really what we're going for or what we want. Uh, so I would say efficiency, efficiency in moving into position, efficient, uh, efficiency with bag placement, efficiency with setting your gun down and oriented properly with the target, uh, and then efficiency finding your target in the optic and getting a good shot on target where you get a hit yeah. on target. Efficiency, so. I think, is a very good word to use because, you know, one thing, if you're not into some of these competitions like PRS competition or some of the NRL stuff and maybe even other uh, sort of uh, outlets for precision shooting, a lot of times some of the really, really good shooters, um, they look, they don't look very hurried, you know, no, I mean, like they all. don't even look like they're, yeah. sometimes it doesn't look like they're trying that hard almost, you know, <laughs> yeah. they just sort of like walk up to the position, but they get shots off so quickly and, you know, they're right back on target so quickly. It's, it's really impressive. Whereas you have somebody who's maybe newer out there and there's a lot of very rushed, hurried body motions and they maybe look like they're moving faster or with more, uh, I don't know, vigor, vigor. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. But they're actually yeah. taking a longer time because yeah. oftentimes there's there's par times that you have to finish a, a stage within and you can't go beyond that time once it once it finishes. If you have targets left over, you don't get to engage those. And right. and a lot of those really good guys, they'll just, they'll smoke a part time. They don't even come close to it, but they're just yeah. moving nice and methodically. Yeah, I'm kind of glad you mentioned that, Jimmy. Um, mentioning times and things like that with efficiency, like Corey said, we will be incorporating a shot timer today too. Okay. We're gonna set our baseline um, and then how to judge that efficiency aspect of it. We will be utilizing that shot timer as well. Okay, cool. So that gets into a little bit of the equipment here that we have today. Now, I mentioned that we have this set up. Now, this is convenient. We're underneath this nice built shelter, and, you know, we have this, uh, this set up here for this reduced standing height uh, post, I'll just call it. Um, so if somebody didn't have this, I'm sure you can probably, you can probably, uh, uh, oh, what's the word? I don't know. Do this on the fly a little bit with other tools, but oh, absolutely. Uh, basically as long as you get something at about, I don't know, what is that? A little over 36 inches, 40 inches or so. Yeah, four feet or so. Yeah, I we've think. got uh, we've got the shot timer. We've got our guns, obviously, and we got ammo for them. Now, you yep. mentioned a bag, and I, this is one thing that I wanted to get to here. Um, a lot of people have bags for long range shooting, but not a lot of people necessarily have this type of bag. Right. And uh, you see just kind of like, well, you guys have those sand socks that you've done before and other things that are usually for putting underneath the buttstock of the rifle when you're in the prone. Uh, but these bags are really useful uh, for all kinds of things. You can put them under the buttstock of the gun, but right. in this case, actually, we're going to be resting the forend of the gun on this bag, right? Yep. So definitely they can be used as a front support as well. So very useful. Uh, they're referred to, this shape is referred to as game changer. Uh, and I think it is a game changer. Right? It really helps you a lot in your shooting position. Uh, but there's different shapes and things that you can utilize for that. This is the one that we're gonna use today. Uh, but there's certain ways that we can manipulate it on different barricades. Uh, today, we're, we're gonna be able to just use it traditionally. You can see there's kind of a flat area right here. Uh, and then there's two points at the bottom. So we'll just be able to kind of lay that bag pretty intuitively on that four by four. Uh, and it should settle right into place and get us a good flat shooting position. Uh, but like you said before, we can use it as rear support. We can use it for all kinds of things. So an extremely useful thing, uh, even if you're a hunter too. I know hunters, uh, they're really concerned about weight. Maybe if they have to hike quite a ways through the mountains or the woods or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but I think once these things kind of show their utility to a person, uh, people become more willing to throw that in their pack mm -hmm. uh, for hunting. I know military snipers do that or comp competitive shooters for sure. Uh, a very useful thing uh, and they come with different fills too so this is more of a medium fill uh, i would say probably the heavier fills are going to be uh they're going to be able to settle a lot better and kind of sit on that barricade more uh more efficiently and give us a better platform to shoot off of um, but it depends on the person's application what they're right. doing what kind of weight they want to carry i mean those heavy fill bags are heavy yeah they're very and heavy to your point like if somebody is thinking about this for uh a, an application outside of competition you know where you can just walk to your stage and you have all your stuff you're not necessarily um in a rush ever or, or you don't find yourself in the same situation like you might in a hunting scenario where you know all of a sudden there there's an elk that popped out at 400 yards and you're you're on right you got to like get into position quickly and all that stuff and you got to unload your pack or you are packing things around for a long time maybe something with a lighter fill like this could be nice but i mean for all those all those folks who are really um 
you know, concerned about weight and maybe they think, well, do I really need to take a bag with me on like a hunt, for example? Uh, I have found, I mean, in my own experiences, which probably pale in comparison to many other hunters experience, you know, um, but in my own experiences and just from what I've seen, there's a lot of really awkward shooting positions that you can find yourself in when you're out hunting and being able to build a position in those awkward situations, but have something like this to rest your rifle on, um, something that's not hard, you know, and something that's not really, uh, it's kind of in a messy shape. Like these bags can sort of take on the, the rocky surface beneath your firearm and then provide a nice smooth, um, kind of area for your gun to rest in, uh, which is so much better. Right. And, you know, ultimately if, if you're going out to, to harvest game or something like that, then the shot is pretty important when it comes Absolutely. down to it. Right? Uh, a lot of shooters, uh, especially in the hunting world, they utilize their packs because that's what they're carrying already. Yeah. Um, one thing the bags can have over the packs is this can actually, like you said, mold to the contour of whatever surface you're going to be shooting off of. So, yeah. Right. And we always go for the hard on soft contact for the newer shooters out there. Uh, so we wouldn't want to just throw our gun up on the, the 4x4 that we're going to be shooting off of today. It'd be real slippery. We don't get enough surface area contact uh, that way. Uh, when we get this soft contact on the hard contact of the rifle, uh, the rifle settles better, uh, which means more stability. Uh, and it just makes, us, uh, makes it a lot easier for us to get our shot off. Uh, so there's definitely a clear advantage uh, to having something yeah. like this. It gives you a little more flexibility too. If you have right. to come up or, or down or left or right or something like that, as soon as you move, the rifle can settle in again. But if you're just right on a, I mean, in this case, obviously, like you said, it's a four by four post, but if it's yep. something else like a tree branch or a rock or, you know, there's not that flexibility. You might get the rifle flat on it at some point, but right. then it's probably not pointed at your target exactly. So you have to move it off that and, you know, less than ideal. And that would become very apparent. We are using the shot timer today. So if we were to try this drill without a bag, uh, chances are it would take us at least a couple more seconds in order to get that shot off on target. Yeah. Maybe even more than that, just because the rifle is not stable enough. So maybe the shooter needs to take a little bit more time to get a shot off. And maybe or maybe not that shot's going to be uh, a good one. Uh, but this is definitely going to give us an advantage and help us be on target a sure. little quicker. Sure. So walk us through the drill here real quick. Is it okay. going to be Justin? We're going to dry fire it first. Yeah. And then uh, and then we'll get into some live fire stuff. But uh, yep. Justin, you're going to be yeah. our demonstrator here. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you want to just uh, grab the gun in the bag, Justin, and we'll set up right here. Uh, we have some blue tape on the ground. I don't know if they can see it or not, but we'll start behind the blue tape here just for consistency. I uh, don't want to start like a couple steps forward or a couple steps back, just uh, the same place. Uh, to try to get a good shot on target uh, on consistency and get a uh, good reading for time. Uh, so Justin's going to step uh, back here and he's going to start uh, bolt open. He's going to have his bag in his left hand. He's right handed. And he's going to have his uh, gun in his right hand. So this, uh, the competitive shooters know, this is kind of the setup for a PRS match. Uh, this is, you know, the primary position you're going to be in. He'll have a magazine loaded, but the bolt is back, so it's not fully loaded yet. Uh, and he's ready to go. Uh, and he's just waiting for that shot timer to go off and then he can run the stage. If he's a competitor, if he's a hunter, he can start to build his position to make a good shot on that uh, animal that he's hunting. Uh, or obviously military sniper, law enforcement sniper, somebody that works professionally, uh, they have their own application where this will apply. Uh, so this is the position we're gonna start in. Uh, on the shot timer, he'll get the beep. He'll take a couple of steps forward. Justin, if you wanna take a couple of steps forward, start to build your position. Uh, he'll start move to build his position. He'll get his bag set, uh, and then he'll go ahead and lay his rifle into position, oriented to we're going to be shooting at a 400-yard target today. Uh, and then from there, he's going to settle in behind the gun uh, and then pick up that target. Yeah, if the bag was a uh, Pac-Man, he put the mouth side down uh, around the 4x4 the four four post there, so then he has the flat back of the bag to rest the gun across, uh, which provides a nice, sturdy platform there and right. then uh so what uh, there's like there's stuff going on here now justin has already gotten a position i think he just he naturally does it he can't even he probably didn't even think about doing this but um he's got a wide stance with his legs uh like how is he getting behind the gun this this can be for somebody who hasn't done this before because i went through this when i when mark and i shot our first prs match uh, it's kind of an awkward thing to get into at first if yeah. you're not used to it so, so there's a lot of things that uh like the listeners um aren't seeing right now. Right. One is even a uh, placement of the bag in my uh, non-shooting hand, uh, how I actually configure the rifle um, as I'm preparing to get into that position. Um, I actually 
pre-figure the bag in my left hand. So once I get up to that barricade, I can easily lay it on there. Um, based on the contour of the bag, you may have to manipulate it in certain ways. Um, but like we talked about efficiency earlier. Um, so I have the bag pre-configured. So once I get, do get up to that barricade, I can just easily lay it over that uh, barricade. Um, something I'm doing with my rifle is I need control over it. So it's not kind of flying all over the place. Uh, with precision rifles, they're a little bit heavier. So I want to maintain that control. I'm actually doing that by actually retaining it under, uh, and pinning it between uh, my forearm against my body, uh, muzzle pointed upwards. Mm -hmm. um, as I come up to the target, uh, my hips and shoulders are squared off to that target. Um, Cause I, even though this uh, barricade, um, the way it's built is not technically facing uh, our target, it's a little offset. Um, so I'm not gonna approach it like squaring up to the barricade itself, I'm squaring up to the target. So okay. um, I want my hips and shoulders square to the target uh, as I come up to that barricade. When I place the bag on, I'm just not throwing the bag on and then having it set however it kind of lies. I'm actually gonna go ahead, take the time, maybe pat it down to make sure the points of contact on that bag have settled in before I go ahead and lay my rifle on it. Yeah, because if, if you just lay it down and it's got like one kind of super filled up side and the other side's kind of flat in terms of the fill, then you've, you've significantly reduced the amount of surface area that your gun is gonna have on the bag, right? So you're, by flattening that out, you're gonna get, you know, I don't know if this is about six inches of bag surface here. You're actually gonna get all six inches resting against the gun instead of maybe one or two. Absolutely. Yeah, right. So after I do that, like Corey said, I'm gonna go ahead and lie the rifle on there. Um, when you lie the rifle on there, uh, there's different techniques. Um, you can go ahead and uh, roll it whether it's kind of uh, front to the rear or uh, the opposite. Um, I just kind of like placing the rifle on there and I'll actually roll it forward. Some people kind of roll it to the rear, hmm. personal preference. Um, some pros, some cons to each one. So. But you do that as opposed to just kind of like slapping Just kind of rifle. slapping it on there like this. Um, the reason I kind of roll it on there, I feel like it settles on that bag a little bit nicer. Not only that, but the entire time I'm doing this, my focus shifts from that bag to the target. So when I do lie my rifle on there, um, the rifle is going to be more or less oriented in that uh, direction of fire. And I, once I get on the rifle, I don't have to go ahead and kind of contort and, excuse me, put a lot of muscle tension to get on target. Mm -hmm. So my focus shifts to the target. So when I lay that rifle on there, it kind of aligns naturally with that uh, direction of fire. Yeah. Now, what do you guys do? So obviously, uh, I just want to go over a few gun things here real quick. Corey, you've got, um, this is your gun, right, Corey? Yeah. The one behind yep. me. Now, this is one that Corey, uh, I'm, we're pointing at guns and saying this and that. <laughs> Sorry for everyone listening. So Justin is actually holding like a, a Ruger precision rifle. It's a standard factory available rifle in 6.5 Creedmoor. Really great option for somebody who's not looking to go full custom or, you know, maybe not uh, looking to spend multiple, multiple thousands of dollars on a, on a super custom rig. Um, now, Corey has more of a custom rig, and actually, the interesting thing I was going to point out here is that Corey's is actually more of a traditional looking stock, whereas, like we have over here with the uh, Ruger, it's a, a chassis gun. And so, the chassis gun, you know, if I'm using terms that maybe some people aren't familiar with, it almost looks like a, a bolt a bolt gun version of an AR-15, if you will. I realize that it's not, uh, you know, but... If you can imagine in your head, it has a fore end with M lock rails on it that's all made out of aluminum. Uh, it's got a, a stock that has all kinds of, you know, length of pole and cheek weld adjustments and stuff like that. Whereas Corey's, it looks a bit like a souped up version of a regular stock that you'd see maybe on a, on a more traditional looking bolt action rifle. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because, you know, when Justin, you went up to the bag, uh, right now Corey has his rifle rested on the bag. Um, <clears throat> where you rest it, is not, uh, again, for somebody who's like newer to the long range game, uh, if you've ever rested your gun, the front part of your gun on a bag, usually it's been out more towards where you'd mount a bipod, right? And then maybe this person would have also an additional rear bag, so they've created these two points of contact front and rear. But in this case, this is our only point of contact. You guys are finding like the center of gravity point. Uh, for you, Justin, on this type of gun, on this Ruger, it's right in front of the mag well. Um, Corey, like on yours, I'm guessing you've probably set up this, uh, this barricade stop thing that you have underneath it right. to where you have it at this nice kind of center of gravity point. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, you'll hear it referred to as a well-balanced rifle. Um, honestly, this one could be better balanced. It's not where I want it right now, but it's, you know, better than, than, uh, some alternatives. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a well-balanced rifle means I could just, uh, get this rifle where mm -hmm. I want it 
just where you see it right right in front of that mag well uh, and then in most cases I don't think it'll do it here because it's not as balanced as I'd like but there's enough weight for the rifle to, to stabilize itself and in most cases you'd be able to just leave it right on the barricade um, just like that without touching it so just a well-balanced rifle um, and that just comes with uh, weight distributed evenly mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's um, options to add weights back here at the buttstock or sometimes with the m-lock you can get weights put on the rail up here uh, so you have some options with that stuff but just getting a good well-balanced rifle uh, is an advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not something that a hunter wants to be dragging through the woods as a 20 pound rifle. It's kind of what I was wondering what you guys would say for uh, whether it's a professional user who's using what they've been issued or yep. if it's a hunter who's using something that they've purposely tried to make really lightweight, it may not be really well balanced. So like Justin, when you have this Ruger here, which I think is they're pretty balanced guns, at least in my experience, we've got obviously a suppressor hanging out on the end of the barrel, which helps offset some of the weight at the rear. Same with the bipod out front. Um, that's the nice thing about these, these competitive style guns, the guys, the guns that guys shoot in PRS, um, you can set them down and as long as you get them pointed in the right place, you don't have to almost touch the gun other than just the trigger to, to set them off. But like, how do you get your gun in a good position and get behind it? Well, if, um, you know, you're not shooting with a super well-balanced rifle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Like, so what does somebody uh, need to do, does it change where they, where they place the rifle or does it change how they get behind the gun? Uh, so there's some advantages just to point out the differences between these two rifles real quick. It really helps to have a barricade stop just like this one has right here. Mm -hmm. Just something where I can lock into that barrier uh, and I'm not putting pressure on my magazine uh, to possibly cause um, trouble while I'm, I'm loading that first round or, or subsequent rounds. Uh, the magazine well on that rifle works pretty decently. Um, with that, it, I don't know if it would keep it completely away from the magazine or not. Um, but it might be something he has to play around with where I just have that barricade um, uh, block right there and I can just kind of push into it, lock into that, that barrier how, however much I think I need to. Uh, so that does uh, help quite a bit uh, with doing that. Uh, with people with less advantageous rifles, kind of like the lighter ones, uh, it just requires that they, you know, you still want it in the same position. Uh, but I find even this rifle is a little lighter than, than I would like. I'm still going to do everything the same as far as getting into position back here, achieving good rifle shoulder connection. Um, but I also want to spot my shots, see where I'm hitting, see if I hit the animal or if I miss my target, see where I miss my target. Uh, so if I have a lighter rifle, especially if you're shooting a higher caliber, definitely have to have good rifle shoulder connection. You're going to be locked into the barricade, so I'm pushed up on that barricade stop. Uh, and then I also use my, uh, my left hand because I'm right-handed to kind of lock down that forehand a little bit. Mm. I'm not it's not a death grip. I'm not like pushing down like with all, all my, mm -hmm. my muscle. But and you don't I'm, want to get a death grip on your barrel because that might screw that up a little bit. Right. I'm not really touching my barrel at all. I don't want to screw with the harmonics or anything like that. But I have pressure down. I usually use my thumb just to hold pressure, uh, help lock in that forehand uh, and get a good balance uh, back and forth. You have to be careful because obviously if I'm putting pressure up here uh, and I'm pressure back here, I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to induce wobble mm -hmm. into my sight picture. Uh, so it is a balance. It's something that people need to play around with. Dry fire uh, helps with that quite a bit. Uh, just getting to know your equipment and what you have to do to achieve good good hits on target. Yeah. Uh, but with the lighter guns, it is a little bit more of a challenge because they don't settle quite as conveniently as so the heavier ones. Instead of Corey relying on the bag for a lot of support, now he's relying on his body. <clears throat> like Corey said earlier, instead of utilizing the bag and a well-balanced rifle to have that rest nicely on that barricade, Corey's going to be utilizing his support hand, all right, to add a little bit of weight, so to speak, to the front of that gun. Uh, and if you need, uh, and excuse me, if he needs weight rearward, he's going to be utilizing um, that uh, rifle uh, shoulder connection as well. Yeah. I've seen some guys too, I mean, if you don't have a barricade stop and you've just got like a real slick stock that even goes back into a floor plate, so no exposed magazine. Uh, you know, some guys I've seen where you really just, you set the rifle down right on that floor plate. Um, so it's the bag in that case is pretty Further close back. to the trigger. Um, and then a lot of guys will just rest their hand or kind of use their support hand right on top of the scope. I don't know yeah, uh, so. if you guys do that much, but it, the scopes, the scopes can take it and they're mounted to the receiver. So you're not going to mess with the barrels harmonics. And, uh, you're, it also happens to allow your support hand to be really close to the turret. If you got a dial too. Yeah, that that's definitely an option. Uh, I will kind of, uh, put a side note next to that too, is, uh, if we're putting a lot of pressure, you know, just, just, a 
a little bit, you know, if it's just resting up here, kind of helping me hold in the position, uh, that's fine. I'm not going to do anything crazy, but if I'm really like getting excited about whatever I'm doing and I'm putting yeah. a lot of torque on that objective lens, I can actually induce a, a miss when I think I'm on target. Sure. Or if you're shooting out of a, a very small, you know, aperture, like a window or, uh, cut out of a, a piece of plywood, whatever they're throwing at you at the PRS matches or whatever it might be. Uh, if, if you find like there's pressure or torque on this objective lens because of whatever you're shooting out of, that can cause that to move. And when you think you're on target, that could actually be a miss because sure. there's, there's tension up here. Uh, so you can, you can shoot like that for sure, but just uh, definitely watch how much pressure uh, you're putting on that or, or if you're pulling in one direction or the other. I uh, definitely want to be wary about, about that. Makes sense. Within so, reason. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very good at interrupting. Sorry, no. uh, Justin, but I wanted to, I wanted to at least bring that up since, uh, I know the setup that you're working with here, uh, over here with the, with the Ruger precision rifle, uh, might look different than what other people are working with. But anyway, Absolutely. so you were over on, you established yeah. kind of a, a, a good connection with the gun in the, in the bag. And yep. So we'll kind of pick up where we left off. Um, hips and shoulders square to the target. Um, and at this point in time, uh, my uh, focus shifts back to the targets when I lie that rifle on that bag. All right, it's going to be more or less kind of orientated uh, in the direction of fire. All right. And so what it looks like you've done here is in order to get down to this height, like we said, so the height is maybe for, for us guys here, it's a little bit above waist height. Yep. Um, you're not bending over a lot at the waist. You really just kind of spread your legs apart, it looks like, until you got your your upper body down to the right level yep so uh he definitely reduced his height just by spreading out his legs a little bit more and and why he's doing that is he's able to keep his center of gravity uh nice and neutral back here so he's not pushing into the gun a wild amount and he's obviously not leaning back because that'd be equally as bad so he's got a good neutral position right here he's able to achieve good rifle shoulder connection as well um, and then he's got his, his uh, left hand up here, kind of locking the, the rifle into position and just creating another point of contact for stability on the barrier. Because uh, the barrier we're shooting off of today is, is pretty, uh, pretty solid. Uh, so he, he's able to do that. Uh, but his hips and shoulders, I know uh, the audience can't see the target. His hips and shoulders are squared off to the target that we're shooting at though. Uh, and then he dropped his silhouette, his body position down to the level that he needs to in order to shoot off of this particular uh, barrier. So, um, and that's what we want. We don't want to fire muscles unnecessarily because uh, when we do that, we'll, we'll start to shake, you know, anything, you know, you figure if you're doing a plank or something, you're creating muscle tension uh, and then we're going to start to shake and all of those stressors are going to be put into our sight picture and just make our job harder as shooters in order to get a good precise shot on target. Mm -hmm. um, so just muscular relaxation. We're still trying to achieve that in the standing position here. And uh, we just have to do some, uh, some off the wall stuff sometimes back here yeah. in order to do that. All right, so I think we got a pretty good idea here. Should we have Justin dry fire it for us? Yeah, uh, Justin, if you wanna go ahead and come off the barricade and then just set up as if we were about to run you on the clock for a PRS match or something like that. I know our camera guys have been enjoying being outside here with the very bright sunlight, but hopefully the listeners out there have been listening to some of the nice birds tweeting and uh, you know other various nature noises. It's like. It's like our own ASMR podcast here. It's a beautiful day. It is. So we have Justin set up here, ready to run the drill. I have the shot timer ready to go. I'm just gonna beep him just to get him used to the beep uh, and give him an indication of when he needs to start. Uh, but he's just gonna do some dry reps of actually setting the bag. Bag placement is crucial. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and then just getting the gun orienti uh, oriented in the proper direction and then just getting into position. So I'll just... Um, use all the terminology that we'd usually use in a PRS match or a competition. So shooter ready, stand by. And you can go ahead and dry fire Justin whenever you're on target. All right, so let's break that down. Uh, if you wanna go ahead and come off of the barricade and we'll start from kind of square one and work all the way up. Uh, so back here, Justin was ready to run the drill. Uh, he's paying attention to the way the bag is in his hand. He's not just kind of holding it there uh, and then he'll figure it out later. He sees what he has to shoot off of. Uh, so he's gonna go ahead and have that uh, gripped uh, how he wants to place that bag. So all he has to do is walk up and everything's kind of uh, oriented in the right direction and ready to go. 
Uh, so that's kind of step one. He wouldn't want to be like, go ahead and just hold it from like one of the straps or something. Like that's not necessarily set up uh, for him to do it efficiently. He'd have to like throw it on the barricade. Uh, not a super ideal uh, position to be in. So just kind of be paying attention to where that bag is at in your hand. Uh, so you can go ahead and set up the correct way. Uh, ready to go. Uh, before he even went through the drill, uh, if you have the opportunity to, uh, he's going to go ahead and get his dope dialed for the target. We're shooting at a 400 yard target today. Uh, and then also reducing the magnification. I would say um, there's techniques to pick up the target that we'll also talk about. Uh, but set your magnification at a level uh, that matches the difficulty of how, how hard you think it is going to be to pick up that target. Uh, for example, if you have really solid reference points downrange, like maybe it's a, a lone tree in a field and the target is right under the tree. Cool, I don't really need you know, my magnification to be dialed way down because I can just find the tree and then line myself up nice and easy and I should be able to pick that target up pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but if it's, uh, if it's more challenging, maybe back that magnification uh, down a little bit, give yourself a wider field of view, be able to hone in on exactly where that target's at and then get on target a lot quicker there. Uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time fishing around for the target, you know, burn up 15 seconds uh, because they're on too high of a magnification and they're yep. just scanning back and forth, looking for it in an open field with not much uh, target reference. Um, or they've got to sit up like we have here where our seven, eight, nine, and a thousand are all, they're obviously at seven, eight, nine hundred and a thousand yards, except right. left to right, they're actually quite close. And so if you're super, you know, looking at a gnat's butt with your magnification and you just come up and you're like, yeah, that's the right berm. And yeah. little do you know, you got dope for 700 yards, but you're shooting on the 900 yard berm. Well, that's right. Yeah. That's, and that's a really easy thing to do. A lot of people are like, oh, I wouldn't do that. Like it, it's definitely an easy thing to do, especially if the targets look exactly the same. Um, really easy to get them mixed up. If you don't have that full field of view uh, to kind of gather all that information that you need. Uh, so Justin's here. He's got his gun all set up, ready to go. Uh, parallax would be set to uh, roughly 400, kind of set up optimally for the target that he needs to shoot. Uh, and then he takes a couple of steps forward to get into position. And when he does that, he's kind of already positioning his feet into an advantageous spot in order to shoot off of this particular height of barrier. Uh, so you have to kind of read the barriers that you're going to shoot off of. If this was two feet lower, uh, Obviously, he's probably not going to be in the standing. He's going to dictate where he steps in order to shoot off of that particular barricade. Uh, if it's higher, maybe he does need to step closer in order to be able to stand straight up and shoot off of that barricade. Uh, so kind of reading the barriers, um, barricades that you have to shoot off of in that manner definitely helps. And then assuming uh, or trying to dictate where you need to place your feet exactly so that we're not sitting here kind of shifting around, uh, moving back and forth. We want to minimize that as much as possible because um, we're just going to chew up time when we do that. So he steps forward, uh, gets still squared off to the target, and then he goes ahead and places his bag, right? Bag placement is crucial. That's not just a rudimentary thing. We, we really want to pay attention to our bag placement. And you can see he kind of padded down that top part of the bag to get it nice and flat. I'm going to go ahead and screw up your bag here real quick, Justin. So if it was placed like that, like if he was just in a hurry, super worried about time, uh, and he went and just put his rifle on the bag just like that, like obviously it's got to slant down and it's going to start to to mess with his position and he can either fight against that position or he can chew up more time and fix the bag and do it the right way right so bag placement is definitely a crucial aspect to this just make sure we're doing it right initially and and we're good to go right so he pats the top of that bag gets good uh good surface area right here to place that rifle and then he goes ahead and he places the rifle on there oriented with the target that he wants to shoot so at this point, Justin's already looking at his target, right? He, he's looking out into the field, finding where that target's at. And when he goes to place that rifle, uh, it's already starting to orient in the direction where he wants to shoot that target, right? So we obviously want to shoot a particular target out there. We don't want to just lay the gun on the bag and then fix things afterwards because yeah. that's potentially going to cause misalignment and and other problems for us. That's something I think a lot of people underestimate. They immediately want to get inside the scope and start finding the target, but even just using, you know, like obviously the rifle scope, you can even use the, the elevation turret on and almost right. like as a, as a very big and not exactly precise iron sight, but it at least gets you pointed in the right direction. And then by the time you're in the scope, you're, it only takes 1% of fidgeting rather than, you know, like uh, a large degree of fidgeting to actually go and find the, uh, find the target. 
when I start building my cheek to stock weld, uh, as I'm doing that and lowering my elevation, like you said, I'm actually looking through, all right, my elevation turret and lining the target up behind that. So like you said, once I get uh, my cheek to stock weld uh, complete, I have less work on the back end to try to get that in my field of view and crosshairs on target. Yeah. So like you said, using the elevation turret as an index point. Well, this uh, beautiful sun out here is burning up our cameras as I've found out one of our cameras is already overheated. So how about we, uh, should we go through this? What do you guys want to do? Should we go through it again once more dry or should we get right into the live fire? What? Yeah, let's, uh, let's have Justin back up and then just do a quick run through just so everybody can see it. And then we'll go ahead and load and make ready and, and go live from cool. there. So Justin's getting ready. He's already got his gun set up, bag in hand the way he wants to. He's looking at his target. He's got that referenced. And then when he's getting ready for the clock, he's looking at where he wants to place that bag on the barricade. Shooter ready. Stand by. Places his bag, pats it down. Good surface area contact. Rocks his gun into position. Uh, and then he, as he's rocking his gun into position, that target is disappearing behind the elevation turret. Uh, and when he, he gets in that optic, uh, the target should be pretty close within his field of view. And he should be just about ready to go. He just needs to do uh, last few tweaks with his position, check his stability, and get that down, round down range. It's also so. where having a nice buttery smooth action comes into play too, where you yep. don't have to be messing up the, the sight picture of your scope or the gun's position much to actually run the bolt. Right, yep. And that's, yeah, that makes a big difference, especially if it's a lighter gun too, and it's uh, the bolt lift on your rifle is a little heavier. It's going to cant the rifle and cause some problems, take up a little bit more time. Yeah. So a nice action is an advantage. Yeah. And there's a lot too that goes into the whole, I mean, obviously we talked a lot about setting up the position, but there's so much that goes into the shot as well, you know, and, and making sure that you're having good follow through and able to actually maybe spot your impact and then also have a quick follow up shot. I mean, you know, right. this, but, but establishing a really good position though, um, is, is getting yourself a large degree of the way there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because if your position's not right, then you may get a halfway decent first shot off, but good luck maybe getting a second shot off because now the gun is twisted around and it's all, you know, goofed up and you're uncomfortable, so you're having to shift your body around. It's just, right, and you're, you're fighting your position, right? We don't want to be fighting our equipment and we don't want to be fighting our position. So yeah. uh, the better we can position ourselves with that, the, the better off we are to, to get good hits on target. So ready right. to go live? Let's do it. Yeah, I'm going to throw some ears on. You going to use the Ruger? Yeah, I'll use the Ruger. All right, sounds good. The Ruger... Uh, Precision rifle here. Funny enough, like we said, it's a it's a factory gun. You can weight it down more uh, for the serious PRS competitors. They might even you know say that this is a fairly lightweight gun, and of course it shoots 6.5 Creedmoor, which is not a recoil heavy cartridge at all. But for the competitive side of things, you know a lot of these guys like to go with either even lighter recoiling stuff just to further enunciate the fact that they don't want their guns to move. <laughs> Try to get rid of all of that recoil oh, yeah, as much yeah. as you can. Yeah. All right, we ready to go? Yep. All right, shooter ready. Stand by. All right, 11.25. So we'll go ahead and go through. So what we want to do with this drill as we're going through, I know we're talking a lot about the position and how to get into position. Uh, but we also want to extract information from it, like how do I know I'm getting better? How do I know I'm doing things right? Uh, so in this process, uh, we would be getting data points. So every run is a data point. Uh, that run for Justin was 11.25. Uh, so maybe his personal goal is to get under 10 seconds or something like that. Uh, so we'll, maybe we'll do five, 10 runs or something like that and then get the average and then say, okay, me as a shooter, this is where I'm at. This is my average. And then as we go to the range, we can start to work on that, start to work on all of these little things that we've been talking about and try to get our average time on target down to whatever our goal is. Yeah. Right. And I would say small baby steps at first and those small little improvements lead to, to the bigger picture eventually. What do you think, Justin? Like, what do you think you could do more efficiently? <laughs> um, I'm curious. I had a lot of site confirmation on target. Um, <laughs> Uh, that round uh, could have been sent uh, significantly earlier. Um, less sight confirmation probably on my part. Okay, sight confirmation being like you're there, but for whatever reason, something in your brain is like, well, let's just make extra sure. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Right. 
Shooter ready. Stand by. Eight twenty-four. Go ahead and unload that round. Twenty-four. So when we do this, uh, when I do this personally, it, uh, audience can figure out how they want to do it exactly. But I usually record times where I get hits on steel. Yeah. Right. So I don't want to necessarily, you know, just get into position and then miss my target quickly. Right. I want like a good balance. Like I want to be able to hit the target. What What is uh, my average time that it takes for me to get into position and actually hit whatever target size it is that you're shooting at? Yeah. Um, at whatever distance. Did you see where that one hit, Justin? Yeah. Was that a little low, actually? Yep. All right, so, and another thing, too, uh, that brings up a good point. So, uh, a common, I'll just tell you some of the common errors we see with stuff like this, especially when we get people out of the prone position. We tend to hone in a lot on the prone position for good reason, too. We're working on fundamentals and, and really trying to get people squared away in that aspect. But when we bring people up into these alternative positions, uh, we see a lot of error with trigger control. And I tell students a lot of times, uh, for me personally, the biggest error I see across the board with pistol, carbine, and precision rifle uh, is trigger control. Uh, so uh, if you're having trouble with this drill or shooting in these alternative positions, uh, really pay attention to uh, how you're manipulating that trigger. A lot of people have a tendency, especially in these alternative positions, uh, we get a wobble zone going on uh, and they just want to time the shot. So, okay, it's moving around a lot and go. Right, and that's not necessarily how we want to do things. Mm -hmm. uh, we want just we want an acceptable wobble zone within within the target, right, within the area of the target that we want to hit, and then we just want to be taking a pressure, 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 and allow that shot to go off. Yeah, we're not forcing it out there. Um, and if we start to rush those, uh, we're really going to see that show up in these alternative positions. Cool. All right, Justin. All right, All right. so Justin, you. Because you had a good position, you were also able to observe the target after, you know, as you shot and after you shot. So you saw that your impacts were a little bit low. We're, you know, messing around with some dope and stuff yep. out here. So I uh, just actually raised uh, and came up in my elevation just a little bit. Okay, cool. All right, shooter ready. Stand by. Eight seven eight. How about that one, Jay? That one was still a little bit low. Was it? Yep. I think I I heard an impact though, right? Yep. Yeah. So, um, oh, what was I going to say? Now I've I've heard you going through like your typical uh, breathing as soon as you get on the gun down there. Like I can I can even audibly <laughs> hear you breathing, which I can hear Justin breathing a lot because I sit next to him in the <laughs> office, but. Uh, you know, basically what that tells me though, is that even though you're trying to, you know, do this in some relative component of, you know, speed, we'll say, or Corey's using the term efficiency, but efficiency involves time. Uh, you're still actually making sure to apply the fundamentals and we're not throwing the fundamentals out just in the name of hitting a lower time, you know, because I, I think you want to do this efficiently. And efficiency also involves actually hitting what you're aiming at. You Absolutely. Know? So. Right. Yeah. And when we're doing, you know, long range shooting, when we're doing these things that look really advanced and, um, you know, kind of high speed or whatever it is, uh, it's really just doing uh, fundamental things at a more efficient pace. So he's still trying to get his shots off in accordance with the fundamentals of marksmanship. He's just doing it efficiently. Should be quicker. And obviously we are, we're doing it in an alternative position. Yeah. Uh, so he still has to focus on his natural point of aim. Uh, which is the reason why he wants his hips and shoulders squared off to that target. Uh, and if he gets into position and maybe his natural point of aim is off target, uh, he's going to shift his feet around back here in order to fine tune that and get his natural point of aim in alignment with that target. Mm -hmm. uh, if he just goes ahead and, you know, muscles the gun into position and then squeezes the shot off, um, it, it might be a bad shot. Uh, the point is, is it's not going to be fundamentally sound, so it's not really going to set him up for a follow on shot if he needs it or to engage further targets. Right, because he has to he has to be squared off behind that gun and oriented properly with the target. Uh, so the sight alignment needs to be there, and the sight picture, all, all that needs to be properly aligned. All right. All right. 
Let's do uh, one more with Justin okay. here, and then uh, I don't know, Corey. You want to go? Yeah, yeah. I can also have I can go, Mister Relatable over here. Okay, shooter ready. Stand by. Ten oh seven. So on that one, I noticed, Justin, the first time you put your rifle down, it was a little bit off on the side of the bag. Yep. And rather than just accept that and kind of try and muscle your way through it, you took the time to fix it. Yeah, uh, I might equate it to like uh, a second or so. Um, but like Corey said, I'm not fighting that throughout my entire engagement. Uh, just kind of took the time on the front end, made sure it was set up properly. Um, and then once it was, uh, the stability was there and then also the recoil management. Uh, like you said, <laughs> yeah, if you're uh, trying to spot that impact, having solid recall management with an ideal position is going to make that a lot more advantageous for your follow-on shots. Sure. Ooh. All right, Corey. Justin? Yeah. I'll switch you. Might have to check the uh, magazine. I'm not sure how many. Was that 10-round magazine? Yeah. Okay. All right, shooter ready. Stand by. Eleven forty-eight. So another thing I didn't talk about is we want good follow-through and recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and a way I kind of like to teach that is just uh, communicate to the students that uh, in order to do that, I want to see where my shot is is hitting. Right? I want to get my shot off efficiently and quickly. Uh, but I also I need information back from that. If especially if I miss the target, I need to know where do I need to correct to. And if I'm just sending that first shot and then jumping off the gun or uh, maybe I'm not properly aligned with the gun and it blows me completely off target and I don't see it. That's a problem. And if I miss the target, like, I, don't, I don't know what I have to do in order to fix that. So good follow through recovery, uh, and recovery is practiced by uh, just uh, good recoil management and then spotting your shot through that optic and seeing mm -hmm. what you need to do to fix that. You mentioned it earlier, but that good shoulder contact with the buttstock of the gun is key. Right. Even, I mean, like if you've got a high recoiling rifle, you know, sometimes you just got to accept that. But if you wince or you kind of are a little off the, the buttstock, it's actually going to make it worse because the gun's going to get some momentum going into your shoulder. And then, you know, any chance of having good follow through and all that is kind of out the window. Right. It kind of uh, shakes up your entire process here. Yeah. It really makes things difficult for you. All right. We'll run you uh, one more time here. Uh, shooter ready. Stand by. Nine, nine, seven. Nice. Nice. Nine, seven. I only get two. Is it Jimmy's turn? No, you can get yeah. one more. Okay. Oh. Justin got a few. You yeah. Know. yeah. I got a couple. Don't shortchange me. All right, shooter ready. <laughs> Stand by. Did not pick that one up. Nope. We're shooting with a suppressor, yep, so I've the shot timer. My suppressor. fastest time, and Justin didn't pick it up. <laughs> I mean, that's very fitting. He's got to be able to say that he ran a faster time than you. Yeah, there's at least three left in here. I'll do a few. Now, like I said here, Mr. Relatable, I have shot in a PRS competition before, uh, but that was a long time ago. I haven't really yeah. messed around with long range guns in yeah. a while. So, and, and with that said, for the competitors out there, like a big thing is just making sure your dope is dialed, making sure your magnification is set where you want it. Yep. Uh, and parallax at an optimal point for the targets that you need to engage. Yep. Uh, and if you're going to dial wind, a base wind, uh, making sure that's squared away. Or if you died a, uh, dialed a base wind on a previous stage, making sure you take that off if you don't want it. Uh, so just simple things that could really uh, mess us up. All right. All right. Shooter ready. Stand by. Make sure I get the time on this one. Oh, I did it to myself. There we go. Nice. Yeah, I uh, I did what we talked about earlier, and I got right into the scope immediately, and I had a hard time finding the target. Maybe cost you a couple seconds. I would say so. Yeah, there was uh, a lot of looking around going on there. 
time, 1244. Right, so just uh, what would help there is just watching the target disappear over the elevation turret, and then it should be about where you want it. Mm -hmm. Maybe shave a second or two off mm -hmm. that time. Yeah, and being, you know, we're all sharing a gun here. I think that my <laughs> length of pull adjustment might be a little bit different than you guys. But yeah, it's not the most ideal situation. <laughs> I, won't, uh, I, won't, I won't blame the gun for uh, what I could have done actually a lot better. All right, shooter ready. Stand by. I did it again. That was a really good time. Uh, 10 30. I get so excited to, so it's very easy to do, and you'll find it, you know, if you, especially when you're in a competition, you know, you're like, you want to just like get to it right away and do it fast, and then you forget stuff. So that was even twice. I did the same thing wrong in a row. I gotta, yeah. Here, let me try one more time and then I'll actually right. pay attention to what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> that was uh, 10 30. Okay. All right, shooter ready. I'm actually gonna back off my magnification a little bit. For reference, yeah, I'm gonna go to 10. 10. 400 yards. Stand by. Nine oh two. Nine oh two. Good time. Broke ten seconds. Nicely done. I concentrated more on doing the thing that I said I wanted to do. So and and that uh, kind of brings up a good point. Someone may be asking, well, what's a good time? Uh, what a good time for myself is probably a different time than what a good time for Corey is. Um, so it's going to be what a good time for that individual is as well. Right. So. Right. And just like I said uh, before, don't necessarily want to go with the lowest time you record, and don't necessarily want to gauge yourself off the highest time you record just getting a good average like what can you consistently do this at and whatever that is that's kind of the time like your time and trying to drive that down is the goal because it will be slightly different every yeah. time it's just can i consistently get into position and get a shot off at this distance at a target this size in under 10 seconds mm -hmm. or whatever it is so uh yeah that's for uh, the people out there to decide you know the standards you put on yourself uh whatever they might be um yeah. Just based and off what they want to do. Sometimes taking more time with something on the front end actually equates to less time overall, right. which is what I found there. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, yeah, I think so before our, our cameramen get severe sunburn here and the cameras literally turn into flames, uh, I'd say we could probably sign off on this one. This is a, yeah. a great drill, though, for people to do. We only went through one 10 round mag and I'd say each of us found some stuff that we can work on to, to get better at. So uh, this, is, this is good stuff. I think we'll certainly come back out here and do more long range podcasts and videos so if uh if that's something you guys want to see definitely let us know in the comments and uh yeah maybe we can make that happen let us know if you like this style of podcast so thanks everybody yeah thank you that's a wrap everybody hope you like this topic if you did be sure to like comment and of course subscribe right here because there's going to be plenty more to come if there's topics you'd like to hear us go over on the Vortex Edge podcast in the future, you can let us know by commenting below or hitting us up on Instagram, which is at Vortex Edge. We'd love to hear your suggestions so we can be bringing you the kind of episodes and topics that you want to hear. Otherwise, we'll be seeing you on a future episode. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Bye.